and they came out to vote for Brexit and then they came out to vote for Boris and it's because they they want change and they want a, what we now think of as a realignment in our politics, a reorientation of government and the political class back towards the values and the interests of ordinary people. My guest today is Danny Kruger. He's a British Conservative MP. He's co-founder of a charity, Only Connect. He's the author of Covenant, The New Politics of Home, Neighbourhood and Nation. Uh, and we're actually talking in his home capital of London. And uh, can I just say to you, Danny, it's great to have the opportunity to talk with somebody who's doing some deep thinking about where we're at. Thank you, John. Thank you. Now, you're part of a group of MPs elected since the 2016 Brexit uh, referendum who call yourselves new conservatives. What makes you different uh, and why should somebody believe that anyone can be a new conservative? Isn't it about bringing back the past? Yeah, well, it's a cheeky name and I'm conscious it raises eyebrows, including among my colleagues who uh, think you can't be a new conservative. And I, I get that. It's slightly a play on New Labour, Tony Blair's uh, rebranding of the right. Labour Party to reflect the changes that had happened in society that yeah. made the old Labour socialism redundant. And obviously, New Labour was very successful politically. The difference, of course, is that conservatism is not redundant. It's not our ideas that need to change. But what happened in the Brexit referendum of 2016, and then again in 2019, when Boris Johnson won a landslide majority, which is when I became an MP, those two votes among you know, we swept the board with voters from places that didn't used to vote Conservative. And in many places didn't vote at all. And they came out to vote for Brexit. And then they came out to vote for Boris and putting their trust in politics for the first time in many cases, because they, they want change. And they wanted what we now think of as a realignment in our politics, a reorientation of government and the political class back towards the values and the interests of ordinary people. And the revolution that has happened, and you know, being Britain, it's a gentle, peaceful revolution for the most part. We don't have to uh, have violent overthrow to change things dramatically, but it is a revolution. We've seen an uprising of the ordinary people of this country against an elite and an establishment that identified itself more with global interests and with ideas of of what modern life is like that are very different from those of the public themselves. And although I don't want to, and it's very important actually to me not to attack individuals, because I think everybody's trying to do their best. But you do have in the British establishment, a class of people who, you know, they sound like me, they went to my side of school and university. Uh, and yet they represent a very, very different idea of Britain than up from, from the one I hold. And the public had enough of it. And in 2016, and then in 2019, they said, we want change. And we think, and the new Conservatives are a group of MPs, as you say, elected since that that moment. We stand for this new politics, which identifies with the economic and cultural interests of ordinary people, which I think of as the Conservative idea. You know, we're the National Party. We stand for the people. And we believe in establishment, and we believe in tradition and ordered institutions. But that fundamentally depends on having an affinity with the public. And I think the establishment in the UK had lost that until until the Brexit referendum and then the 2019 election. I want to come back to that disengagement mm. by the modern elites or mm. the establishment, mm. if you like, uh, to your own seat. We share something in common. Uh, I had a very big rural seat. Mm. Actually, mine might have been a bit bigger than yours because was. it was basically the size of England. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much How the many same people? Size. What was the, what was uh, the population? Around in those days... Uh, 75 to 80,000. Yeah, yeah that's the same as me. Yeah, but um, yeah. but a vastly bigger yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and no major uh, urban centres. Yeah. Uh, I think you said you've got no McDonald's in your electorate. But that's right. the, the point I wanted to just ask about that is that I assume that there would be greater sympathy because in the end, in politics, you've got to win enough votes, yeah. you know, 50% plus one yeah. to be able to have that say yeah. in the chamber. Yeah. So you're you live in a part of England that 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 is a bit more traditionally aligned. Yeah. So I live in a. I mean, I represent a seat that has has been conservative for as long as anyone can remember. So I don't come from what we now call the Red Wall, those post-industrial yeah. towns in the north of England that that always used to vote Labour. 
so, but my, the colleagues that I work with mostly do. And I think there is an affinity, and this is why I think the Conservative Party has got such a unique value and our tradition has so much to offer the, the present moment because we do unite the country, place the rural heartlands, the coastal communities, the suburbs of England that have, you know, traditionally voted Conservative. But we're also able to align with those post-industrial places. And the offer of Brexit and then what Boris stood for in 2019, it was the same message. You know, places, you know, my voters who, you know, true blue Tories resonate with the same message about national sovereignty, about freedom, about the importance of family and community, about strong borders, uh, about personal independence and self-responsibility, about doing the right thing in your neighbourhood, about patriotism, strong defence. These messages resonated with these new voters of ours mm. in the in the in industrial towns. So, and that was what was so brilliant about that that landslide. We had one message, and you know, we had we we won a national vote. We won a national mandate: north and south, rich and poor, rural and urban, uh, or rural and suburban, I should say, because the, the you know the inner cities still mostly voted Labour. Uh, and that's the unity I think that our movement, the conservative movement, is able to generate if it gets its message right. Now, you made a very interesting uh, remark in there, uh, and I can relate to it, I think. Uh, I was recently found myself uh, taking a different view uh, to many people who were university educated, which I am, who were comfortably off, which I, you know, I am, and I'm thankful for that. I'm very fortunate. Uh, and, you know, I've sort of had a good education and all the rest of that. But I'm out of sync with their thinking on yeah. a lot of things. So I can kind of relate. Yeah. Um, uh, and that raises the issue of why is it that despite the evidence of the failure of many of the economic and social policies that have been pursued by what might broadly be called the left, mm. that intelligent and thoughtful people who have done very well indeed can't see that it's not working. You mm. talk alignment and levelling up in Australia, in, in Britain, mm. but but the, the the elites are actually supporting the very policies mm. that have made the problem so bad. Well, I think we can be cynical and recognise that the policies have been good for the elite. I mean, the, the critical worse. feature is 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 uh, you know the two great things that have happened over this century, and you've written about this, John, are, you know, cheap money. Uh, which has flowed into asset inf asset, asset yeah. prices, asset inflation, which is, of course, a great benefit if you happen to own assets. Yeah. So we've all seen our house prices rise, those of us who own our own properties. The fact that nobody else can get on the housing ladder is somebody else's problem. Mm. Uh, so those of us with assets, and then, of course, you can pass it on to your children, so they'll be okay too, have benefited. The other great policy decision that's been taken in our times in the UK is effectively open borders. So we've had mass migration into this country, first when Tony Blair o opened the borders to EU migrants. And then since Brexit, madly, we've, we've, we've expanded our immigration from the rest of the world, and uh, which we're now able to do, but I think it was a misguided step. So we've had huge flows of cheap labour into the country, which again is a great benefit to those of us who need, you know, someone to wash the car and clean the house and, you know, walk the dog. You know, there, there are all these cheap jobs that make life better for people with, with wealth. And the other reason why I think, I mean, because that's cynical, I, you know, the fact is it's to the benefit of the, of the wealthy, this, the, economic, the economy we have. Um, but I think the more profound reason why the elite have uh, connived at this system is that is cultural. The power of the argument that we need to be open to the world, that we should be um, sustaining a large welfare state, uh, which, you know, which requires borrowing money and raising uh, taxes on enterprise to sustain a sort of class of publicly funded professionals as well as the recipients of welfare. These things feel in culturally and morally good to, uh, to many people. And the argument about migration, of course, is instantly associated with race and in the UK with the history of colonialism and empire, which for, for many people feels like we have to expiate our former crimes by, uh, by, by admitting large numbers of people and trying to accommodate uh, rates of immigration, which we simply can't. So I think there's a, there's a selfish economic 
story and there's a cultural one which between them have induced people to to support this regime and then and then our, it's our fault on the right in politics of not mounting effective counter arguments and changing the changing the narrative and that's what we need to do uh, you see the, the the interesting part of that though let's mm. drill into it for a moment mm. is that is that what you've described as self interest and mm. you know the powers that be, the elites in it, perhaps Australian language, establishment in your language, mm -hmm. running policies but after the GFC, during COVID, mm -hmm. now often in the name of preserving the environment, which exacerbate that problem of inflation, mm -hmm. which so damages working class uh, and, and, and less fortunate people mm -hmm. at the same time as it advantages the well, the better off. Mm -hmm. um, there are two things that strike you about it. One is that it's intellectually indefensible. Mm -hmm. The evidence is in. You know, 50 mm. years of this approach was proving to be a disaster for large numbers of our people mm. and they deeply resent it. Mm. And the second thing that's striking about it is that they go on dressing it up in nice language as though they care and they're being compassionate. I find that very galling. Mm. Aren't they intelligent enough to recognise that what is happening here to a very great degree is a denial of agency? Mm. It's very patronising, you know? We love yeah. you so we'll give you a whole lot of welfare rather than doing the meaningful thing, yeah. running an economy that gives you a job and agency and choice in life. We've had a culture, particularly in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in Australia, over 50 years of, um, of, of welfare policy that has exacerbated the problem it's intending to resolve. And the argument is always, we need to give more money and we need to uh, atone for the, what are called structural or systemic injustices in the system, which as you say, fundamentally, deny agency to the people that we're trying to help. And you know, I've done a lot of work in uh, in prisons and with, with families at risk, my charity that I, I've, I ran for 10 years before becoming an MP. And I saw so clearly how disastrous welfare is for families and for individuals, for these proud young men who, because of all sorts of reasons, and it's, it's worth drilling into them, but let, let put those to one side, for all the reasons that they end up in crime, they have such agency, they have such power to influence their own lives, certainly the lives of their families and their neighbourhoods. And, th and that effect is so often disastrous. You know, they, they destroy families, they destroy uh, people's lives in their communities through crime. They have such power of, uh, of effect on other people. And yet the culture tells them, you're a victim. You're not responsible for your own behaviour. You didn't uh, make the mess you're in. Society made it. And yes, we have to put you away because the law says that, but we're no, no, not really going to hold you to account for it. And certainly we're not going to help you fix yourself. And I, I mean, I went to Texas years ago when um, to make a documentary for the BBC about prisons when I was doing my prison work. Because in Texas, you know, as you know, very, hard, very tough law and order state. Uh, and they had a prison population that was double the size of the UK's, even though the population of Texas is half the size of the UK. So they had a huge incarceration rate there. And the Republican uh, governor and, and Senate of Texas realized that this was financially unsustainable. And they changed their whole system to say, we're going to put responsibility on the criminal. We're not going to make excuses for these criminals. If you do the crime, you do the time. We're going to have tough, tough justice. But we're also going to support you on the way out. And what that means is putting responsibility on you to help get a job and to support your family. But we as a society will help you do that. Whereas here in the UK, we do the things the other way around. We don't really hold people to account for their own behaviour, but nor do we really help them try and get their lives back together. So we kind of say, you're on your own. We're going to make excuses for your behaviour, but we're not going, to, not going to help you. And I think we need a, a culture of responsibility, of tough justice. And I'm not just talking about crime here. I'm talking about the principle of individual responsibility. You are responsible for the state of your life and that of your family. But we as a society, which doesn't mean the state, it means society as a whole, will support you to make good choices and pick you up when you fall and give you a second chance. And, and we'll, we, we'll, we'll, we'll be there for you as a community. And that is more about civil society than about government action. Government can play a role. So I think we, we get things very wrong. And, uh, and we do, as you say, we, we've essentially infantilized the population by treating them as helpless victims who just need money. And, and, and yes, I do blame the left and the liberal establishment for the situation we're in. Here in the UK, we have 5 million people 
uh, on out of work benefits. You know, this is about mm. out of a you know working age population of forty million. I mean, it's absolutely unacceptable the rate of welfare dependence we have, and these are people who could and should and would like to work. You know, a, a crisis of obesity, a crisis of mental ill health, all of which is the product of a society that isn't working, and welfare is a big contributor to that. One of the, just teasing out a little the issue of the response, if you like, of the establishment or the elites, the bureaucracy, mm. the expertocracy, yes. as Frank Ferruti calls it. Uh, you think of it post-Brexit, you had the distinct impression that there was a patron, oh, that was the uneducated, that yeah. was the people who don't understand. Yeah. We'll do everything we can to ignore the will of the people and find ways around it. Mm. Regardless, that's not a judgment on whether Britain should have remained or not. I don't want to go there. It's just that the will of the people was expressed and they're not respected, it seems to me. And that just breeds further cynicism. We've got a parallel for that in Australia. You can't deviate them. They won't be deviated. Their view of society is right. It's quite profoundly, in my view, anti-democratic. And you've written a lot about the need to engage citizens. Yeah. If I were an ordinary Brit citizen out there at the moment, and I know I'm disengaged, Lord yeah. Sumption's told me that vast numbers of, us, of, of Brits used to belong to one political party or the other. Yeah. Now there are more members of the Royal Bird Watchers Society yeah. than there are political yeah. parties. So and there are parallels in Australia. Yeah. Why would you get involved when you get the impression yeah. that you're being patronised, you're not being yeah. listened to and your views aren't yeah. welcome? Because, in fact, you are being patronised and your views aren't welcome. Yeah. What, how do you re-engage people? Because we need them back in the public square. Yeah. So your first point is is so important that the the, the system, the elite, the, the the establishment culture disregards the opinions of ordinary people, and that was what was so wrong with the European Union. Because when a country voted against one of their treaties, they didn't accept mm. that their treaty had been rejected. They told that country to vote again. I mean, literally, you know, Ireland had to vote three times to get the Lisbon Treaty. I think it was through. Um, And finally, they voted the right way and (laughs) everything proceeded. Fortunately, Brexit was honoured, finally. I mean, it was a battle because uh, the the political system didn't want to accept the vote, the the decision of the people. But thanks to Boris and and my party, we eventually forced it through. And and that has now happened. But but you're right, the the other side won't let go. And, uh, And... the challenge for for us, I think, and for those of us elected with Boris on that mandate, is to deliver the change that they, those people who voted for us, demanded. Because otherwise, they will be utterly disillusioned. And I said we don't have violent revolution in this country. Well, that's only because every in every generation, often after some trouble, but eventually, over history, the political system in this country has accommodated itself to what the people want. Yeah, uh, that's the key. That's the point I'm really uh, yeah. making. Whether it was right or wrong is not for bureaucrats yeah. in London yeah. and so forth to decide. Yeah. Yeah. The people have spoken. That's right. When you then look as though you're frustrating it, and I would argue, in fact, by frustrating it, mm. have had a lot to do with the, if I may say so, the stagnancy mm. of the British economy. Yes, that's the right. The uncertainty, yeah. the, you know, um, the dragging of the heels, yeah, yeah. the lack of clarity, the lack of commitment, the lack of energy. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're getting a double whammy, really. You're, you're yeah. breaking people's trust. You're damaging the economy. That further disillusions people. Absolutely. Well, very well put. And I mean, I think the, the great argument for Brexit was, wasn't just about sovereignty, although that was fundamental. It wasn't even about immigration, although that was extremely important to the public. The, for me, the great argument was that it would put the British government in charge of Britain properly, and it would compel the British government to mm. to deliver and to improve. And f- we have a fundamentally dysfunctional and inadequate system of government here, which is a shameful thing to admit, but it's the case, and you see it all the time. You saw it through COVID, and I'm afraid you're seeing it still. And what Brexit represented was the opportunity to not just change our relationship with the EU, which is, in a sense, secondary, because the real problems with Britain were not our, our membership of the EU. Our problems were internal. Yeah. And uh, Brexit represented the chance to put things right and to reform Whitehall. And that was what Boris was elected to do. And the great shame of all the political trouble that he got into and the distractions of COVID and then Ukraine and all our changes of leader and everything have meant that we haven't yet done the, the second great reform that the public demanded of us, which was to make the state culturally aligned with them. So not, you know, mad internationalism and woke cultural politics, but 
on their side politically, but then also just to make the state function better. And there is so much wrong with the workings of the British government. Uh, not about individuals. It's not about individual ministers or even individual civil servants. They're all they're all victims together of this broken model. And you describe our economic malaise. I think that is absolutely bound up in this. We you know we we decision making is so slow. It's often very contradictory. It's often very you know it's marginal tinkerings that we're able to do. And the big changes that Brexit authorised haven't yet been delivered. To go back to, for a moment, I'd like to now focus on something you've, you've plainly thought a lot about, in which is, you might be called broad economic and national outcomes, do interact in very real ways with social policy. And yes. You've written a lot about that. You've written about citizenship uh, and so forth. Firstly, the US, since I left school, and I, you know, that was quite a while ago in the mid-70s, but since that time, the, the population of the US has roughly doubled. But the population of the jails, and overwhelmingly it's young men, has, has gone up around 750%. Wow. It's a staggering sort mm. of um, indictment, really, of, mm. of a society that's plainly producing boys who are not coping. Mm. What's happening to families that's mm. so disastrous? Yeah. Right across the Western world, I don't want to single out the Americans. Mm. I mean, here, uh, you know, you and I would say that functional environment that a kid grows up is important and we shouldn't discard marriage, but marriage has been yeah. for 50% of the kids that land on the ground in this country, I understand. Yeah. Um, there's no marriage structure involved. Yes, that's right. And half of all children are now in living in homes without both of their parents. So we have exploded the traditional model of the family and there are a whole bunch of causes of that. But the one thing that I think the state can do is to support the model of family life that is, as it were, historically endorsed. It's the one that we've had traditionally. It's the one that most people want. And it's so interesting how, despite all the, as it were, attacks on marriage, despite the whole you know, individualistic culture, which says it's all about me and my journey, and you know, I don't need other people, I'm just going to seek my own path, despite all of that narcissistic culture we have, still what people want, what everybody wants, is to settle down, to find some one person to commit themselves to and settle down with, uh, you hope for life, and, and to have children with them and to stay together through as those children grow up. You know, you won't find anyone who doesn't really want that for themselves. Um, I mean, you might find a few, but but the, this, this golden thread of the ideal of commitment and staying together uh, and fidelity, faithfulness, and essentially putting other people ahead of yourself. This is what we want. This isn't some quirky, kooky, conservative idea. This is what everybody wants. And so it's such a shame that we talk about elite culture. It is such a shame that we seem unable to make the case for that model when it's what the public, every individual, seems to want for themselves. And so what we should be doing, I believe, and what historically we have done, and actually what many other countries do much better than us, is to recognise the family as an economic unit, because often, often it is money that drives families apart, breaks up relationships, as we know. We need to make it easier to look after your own kids, to easy to look after your, old, your own old folks as well. I mean, that's a massive issue. The breakdown of family life has, has led to the loneliness and the abandonment of the old, as well as to children being put into unsatisfactory daycare and so on. So we need family life for all generations. And I think we should be recognising the the economy of the household, you know, the word oikos, from which we get the word economy, is the ancient Greek word for the household. So the economy is rooted in, in the home. And the UK has abandoned this idea. We have individual taxation. We don't recognise your relationships, your dependencies, your dependence in the, in the tax system, which most other countries do. Um, nor do we give any support for marriage, which is overwhelmingly the best predictor of stability and, and the endurance of a, of a couple relationship. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of practical stuff, you know, house building, we, we build houses for individuals and single people rather than families. You know, we have a chronically bad transport system, so people spending long hours and commuting, which is bad for family life. 
Uh, we have a very dislocated economy anyway, which means you can't get a good job near your home unless you live in a big city. So I think there's a whole, if we just oriented the economy back towards the home and the family, which as I say, is the way people want to live. Uh, I think we could do so much more to stop that chronic problem of family breakdown, which as you say, leads to crime, welfare dependence and all the, all the distress that we see. We've talked about Brexit, of course, in many ways. I, I, I accept that uh, it was not, as sometimes claimed, a debate about racism. It was more a, ball, a, a debate about uncontrolled immigration. Yeah. Who can come here, under what circumstances, how many mm. we can actually absorb. What would a coherent immigration uh, and, for that matter, migrant mm. uh, pop, uh, policy look like from yeah. your perspective, can I ask? Because yes. I know these are hot-button issues. Uh, one of the reasons I imagine your side of the politics is in trouble is that people wanted as part of the Brexit deal these issues resolved and it hasn't happened. That's right. So w the great slogan of Brexit was take back control. Yeah. And that was about sovereignty and power. Uh, but it was really about, the, about taking back control of our borders and taking back control of immigration. And we've seen migration, net migration has risen since uh, since Brexit. So there were 200,000 people net coming into the country, net of emigration uh, in 2019. And it's now, last year was over 600,000. Many of those were refugees from Ukraine and Hong Kong. We've admitted a lot of people escaping the uh, Chinese crackdown in Hong Kong. So I'm proud of that. But we've opened the borders to large numbers of students, students' families, I think rather preposterously. You can come here if your if your relative is studying. Uh, and we have a very low uh, salary threshold for a work visa lower than the national average and the national average wage. So we've, we're importing low skilled migration. And as a result, we have a lot of people uh, who aren't working in our own country, who, who could and should be. So I think we need to reform those things, reduce the number of visas we're, we're giving out. The most hot button issue on the migration story in the UK at the moment is illegal migration. We have this chronic problem of small boats crossing from the French side of the English Channel to our shores and 45,000 last year. The number is falling and the government is gripping this problem very hard, but we r remain having unacceptably high numbers of people crossing over and then able to claim asylum and live here with impunity. And we, we need to remove people who come here illegally. We have now passed a law that will enable that, but we're entangled in various legal challenges, mm -hmm. including the European Court, which despite Brexit, we're still part of the European Convention on Human Rights, which really? preceded the EU. So we're subject to a court in Strasbourg, uh, which decides in its own, on its own authority to overrule British Parliament, which I think most British people think, hang on, didn't we vote to get out of that kind of arrangement? So I think we do need to get out of that arrangement. But that's a huge political challenge at the moment that the government isn't yet prepared to do. So we need to take some bold steps on all of these topics, but fundamentally, we can't have the rates of migration we have. You know, over a million people arriving here last year, as I say, many you know, net six hundred thousand, uh, is absolutely unsustainable. I mean, the population of the UK has grown by eight million people since the turn of the century. As I say, for a population of in a very crowded island, crowded in island. Well, that's right. I mean, is that indeed. Uh, we can't. We we haven't got the housing. We haven't got the doctors, the school places. The you know the just, we don't have the space and and the impact on on cultural cohesion. I'm afraid to say, looking at what's been going on in, in London in recent weeks in response to the Israel Palestine conflict. You know, I'm afraid we have living in our country very many people who are culturally antipathetic. They're culturally hostile. Yeah. To, to our country and to its values. And so it's not just a practical question mm. about capacity, it's about our sense of ourselves as a country. And fundamentally, we need to reduce mm. migration for both economic and cultural reasons. Can I ask you, Danny, what in your view is a right and sensible, dare I even say, compassionate nationalism? Nationalism has a bad name now. Yeah. Uh, you've got internationalists who think, no, no, we ought to be borderless. But they're usually the people who advocate mm. that and almost never the people who live side by side by the problems that are yes, created of, uh, of the very sort you're talking about by yeah. those who come here who 
absolutely despise the values of the country they've yeah. fled to. Yeah. So what's a healthy nationalism, well, a I right think, nationalism? Yeah, I think nationalism like? is an interesting uh, – well, national is a good word. And uh, we, we have a difficulty with it in the UK, uh, partly because it, obviously it's associations with European nationalism, which we've always stood apart from, thankfully, and, uh, and, and you know, have helped defeat. And we have within our own, own country na the nationalism of Scotland and Wales. Uh, so we tend to use, uh, well, we talk about the union uh, and we're, we're uncomfortable with, with, with nation and nationalism, which I think is a great shame because there is something tremendous and important about the nation, the nation state, our affinity for our country. And my view and why I voted for Brexit is that I think the only, the ultimate, the highest political loyalty that a person can have is to their nation. We are all people, we share our common humanity and we have obligations of friendship and charity to the rest of the world. But you can only owe political allegiance to your to the to the nation state, in my view, because anything else, well, it lacks the demos, it lacks the the people, mm. uh, and what you're talking about then is some international uh, source of power, whether that's the EU or, or, or some new global state, which you know we see forming in people's minds all the time. And I'm worried about the World Health Organization, by the way, in the similar vein, because it's a huge power grab that is being contemplated at the WHO. I think we need to be very very careful of international institutions which assert supremacy over nations so i think it should be possible to make that case and then we should also be able confidently to say that nations are distinct and they have their tra particular traditions and their particular cultures and that we belong as individuals to to national cultures to who, who to which we should have a proud sense of allegiance and diversity uh, needn't be a source of weakness but it will be unless people, from whatever background, culturally, religiously, nationally, unless they recognise that their political allegiance, their ultimate loyalty is to their nation and that every other culture that they have is subsidiary to that, even if it was uh, supreme before. If they've come to this country, they owe their allegiance to the British state and to the institutions and to a degree to its history as well. I think it's important that people imbibe the history. We're all immigrants to some degree, most of us, from, we've all got family from, who come from elsewhere. Um, we are a very uh, diverse nation in, in the UK. But on arrival, well, after uh, naturalisation, I think it's important that people say, this is now my country and I, and I share its history and I am the co-heir. Wherever my, my family might have come from, I am the, I am the heir to the inheritance of this state even if my family only arrived five minutes ago. And, and, and what is so great about the British national tradition, I think, is that we're not like European countries have a kind of blood and soil identity. Uh, because we've always been a quite a global country, there's been a, and, and because we haven't had politics which has produced that, those sort of ag aggressive nationalisms, our nationalism is civic. It's about institutions. It's not about, it's not about blood. And it's why I think we have the potential to accommodate the, uh, the the immigration that we have had, the problem is we can't accommodate it at the rate that we're getting it at the moment. Uh, it's just we will be absolutely overwhelmed, uh, and and that business of accommodation uh, will not be possible with the, with the with the numbers we're dealing with at the moment. But I think there is still every reason to think that if we had a robust civic national story to tell, we can uh, we can manage. Uh, and as viewers might note, you're wearing your ARC lanyard. I've taken mine off, but <laughs> at the time of this recording, we're in London at the Alliance of Responsible Citizens Gathering. We've been talking a lot about narrative and a lot about a better narrative because we've imbued our societies with very negative mm. narratives. Mm. Um, to, if you like, land the aeroplane, I'd just be interested in your views. Shortly before he died, I had the honour, and it was an honour, of talking to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who in this country seems mm. to be revered as mm. a deep and thoughtful man, yes, and indeed. a very kind and compassionate man. And he, at the time, uh, told me that he was literally travelling around village to village, city to city, rural area to rural area, around Britain, talking to young people. He wanted to know um, two big things. How did they feel about the future and what gave them their moral compass? Mm. He said, two th and he said the answer to both, and this is four or five years ago now, 
uh, were very interesting. He said, they actually think it's going to be much tougher for them. Mm. They get it. Mm. They know that the West's economies are not doing well, and particularly in the poorer parts of Britain, they get it. Mm. That's interesting. But the th one that I wanted to drill into, he said, most of them feel that they've not been given a moral story. They've not mm. been given a moral compass. So what they've actually done is find someone in their life that they admire. At least you hope it's someone they mm. admire. Mm. Uh, a grandmother or a wise old man down the end of the street mm. and tried to say, well, I want to be like that person. Mm. But it's not actually a moral code, is it? It's not mm. a uh, not giving someone a compass by which they can navigate their own lives. No. You've written although, a bit about this. Yes, although... You know, we we all do learn from each other and identifying an older person in your life to look up to and try and live by their lights, I think, is a pretty good proxy for uh, uh, for a moral code. What you hope is that there is a shared set of understandings that young people can tap into, but they will only do it by through role models and through relationships. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we... Sh can imagine and it wouldn't be a good situation to to sort of you know broadcast like the north koreans in you know through megaphones into every every home and every classroom uh telling people what to believe except that once in this country particularly you had probably the unifying influence of a, a broadly traditional christian world yes. view the strength yes. of the anglican church yes love your neighbor be a good citizen at the very least yes and, and, I think and also yeah. do forgiveness yeah. And, and, yeah. and get on with people yes so, so what's the, the substitute yeah yes yeah. so, well there isn't one there isn't one that is the only one and the old story has to be the new story it just needs to be represented and made fit for the moment and i think i mean why i'm i remain an optimist even though I, in my book i talk you know the first chapter is all about how terrible things are and how and how precarious we are i mean i do think you you've got greater experience don but i mean have you ever known a time when they feel like more existential threats to the no. well-being of our of our civilization internal and external yeah and and exactly uh, you know the old fashioned threats mil military ones are back yeah um but we have these new threats of sort of cultural yeah. dismantling that we've yeah. we've done to ourselves so i think we are enormously at risk even if some of the cataclysmic threats that we imagine like climate change might be overblown there are enough dangers and quite enough uh so i in think in fact by focusing on the potentially that once you just described as yes. cataclysmic we may actually be inviting other more immediate crises yes. that mean we'll never be on the yes. deal we, they'll become yeah. irrelevant yes yes indeed so it's that serious yes, in indeed. my view and, well i think the, yes exactly so the responses to these threats mm. i mean climate change was one but you know, pandemics is another. You know, the response to global health scares can be catastrophic too. So I think we need to be very careful. Likewise, the response to the military threats that we see. So yes, the the the, the, the cure can be worse than the disease in, in many ways. But but anyway, what, there, there are huge numbers of threats. Nevertheless, I remain optimistic, partly because I think that, you know, as Gerald Manny Hopkins said, nature is never spent, and and what the 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 core of our being remains one of love relationship, our commitment to each other, uh, our sense of being created for a purpose. And we are instinctively about building networks, relationships, institutions which sustain our society. And I think people will always want to do that. And, and, and the other reason I'm hopeful is, paradoxically, I think modernity can help create the kind of, in many ways, the old fashioned society that we all like. I mean, we talk about our rural constituencies and I see in Wiltshire, rural Wiltshire technology developing opportunities for agriculture which will produce the same yields that you know 40 years ago were produced through chemicals and pesticides and in a mass monoculture yes. disastrous ag agricultural practices but nevertheless fed our growing urban populations we can we can grow enough food to feed the world without wrecking the natural environment and I do think we should be very concerned about the health of the natural world I just think the whole climate co conversation is is misguided. We should be thinking about habitat, the health of our soil and our water, and we can do that. We can feed the feed the world in a healthy and sustainable way using technology. So there's all sorts of positives, and then you create a kind of you create a community that 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 is the sort that a good conservative would want. You know, it's beautiful, it's settled. People are living locally. They're eating local produce. They're having a family life. They're taking part in their neighbourhoods. It might feel quite old-fashioned, but actually it's enabled by modernity. And so the modern world could be so much better. It could be fairer, more equal, more just, more free 
than any society that we've ever had. So I believe in the positive message and well done for setting this conference up with that spirit. You're not just trying to call attention to all kind of threats. You're saying that there is the opportunity for, there's real hope in our, in this moment, but we do have to stand up to the enemies within and without. Uh, and we need to correct the story that our culture is telling itself. But I think if we do that, we can have an abundant uh, and just society. It's been a pleasure, Danny. And I'm great, John. I really sincerely say to you, I admire your commitment mm. to a better and stronger future for your people. Likewise. Very, very grateful. Thank you, John. Thank you.